Hello, I am Professor Cyrus Sotzes, and today I'm going to be talking to you about photography. Uh, more specifically, the fundamentals of photography in terms of what makes a picture good or bad, and how to become a good photojournalist, including how to write proper captions and really how to tell a story uh, with photography. Um, if you're watching this, you're probably one of my students. Um, and if not, I hope you learned something regardless. But here we go. So I'm going to, uh, today's lesson is going to be presented through two PowerPoints. Um, again, the first one will cover the fundamentals of photography, and the second one will cover photojournalism. So why don't I open the first one? right here and it just occurred to me despite the fact that i have made some edits to these that um my precious beloved dog's gonna be in a lot of these he recently passed away um i shoot and i gotta i have to i have to keep it together i have to okay here we go so and again that is my dog indiana he passed away a little over two months ago um this picture was taken uh at lake tahoe i believe this is called emerald bay um, it's a, it's obviously a beautiful setting and part of what you're going to learn just from this, this photo right here is the rule of thirds, which is what I followed for the placement of my dog Indy in addition to the island in the picture as well. Um, notice the depth of field in terms of determining, um, that the depth of field is pretty self-explanatory, but you know, you can actually see a three dimensional aspect of the photo. We'll cover all that and so much more. Um, so starting off first with photography basics. A good photo shows a, a myriad of things. A good photo can show action. A good photo can show emotion. Um, and a good photo provides context. And that's really important when it comes to telling a story. And we'll delve into photojournalism in just a bit here. Um, so photos should be shot at different angles. And there's three uh, primary angles for photography. Those are the establishment shot, um, sometimes those are called the scene setters. Oftentimes, establishment shots are shot from far away, and you capture an entire setting of a photographer, of a photo, sorry, uh, in the process. So this first photo right here, for example, can be defined as an establishment shot because you're really capturing the entire setting um, in one photo. Your medium shot puts your subjects in context, but you're not seeing the minute detail that a close-up will show you. So the second photo right here is an example of your medium shot. The same setting as the first one, but now you're seeing individual subjects and you're seeing them again in context. Um, and notice with the second photo, there's depth of field where the subjects in the background are blurred out, which helps you determine that the subjects in the foreground are indeed in the foreground and closer. Um, whereas, and then the close up is again, you're focusing on very specific details. And I'll show you an example of a close up in just a second. Um, but for this, but just to teach you right here, if we zoomed in, for example, this photo of the kiss right here, uh, this, this formal uh, greeting between two individuals, oftentimes in a lot of cultures, they kiss each other on the cheek, either one cheek or both cheeks. And so if we had zoomed in to this part of the photo right here, uh, and actually saw details of the male subject's beard, maybe the female subject's makeup, then you would call that a close-up photo. Um, all photos, again, must have depth of field. Um, they must have composition, which indicates where your subjects are in the photo uh, and where other items are as well. And all photos must have proper exposure. Exposure refers to lighting. And we'll cover all of that in detail in this uh, lecture. So, and here's an example of a close-up, and this is a photo, again, of my dog, who will be an example uh, in a lot of these photos. Um, so, my, uh, my dog's former um, bather, groomer, he would just get baths, uh, used to send me photos sometimes. And notice this is a great example of a close-up. You see my dog's, uh, some fine details on my dog's nose. Uh, his mouth, you can see little hairs on his lip, you can see his eye color. So this is a close-up shot. Um, and then here's an example of a medium shot. And this was taken uh, in Pensacola, Florida. They have incredible white sand beaches, and my dog loved the beach. Um, but notice I, you don't see the same details you saw in the, in the previous photo, whereas this one you're seeing really fine details of his face. In this one, you're simply seeing the subject in context to his or her surroundings, right? So you can tell that the dog is uh, in, in the water at a beach, 
Um, you can see sand, so which could indicate that he's not swimming, he's standing. Um, and you also follow what's called the rule of thirds. I'll go over that in just a minute as well. And yeah, it hurts seeing my dog. He loved the beach. He was so happy in this trip. Um, him and I went traveled 32 states together in two countries. Uh, anyways, and then the establishment shot. Um, this was when my, my dog Indy and I uh, traveled to Arkansas. Um, this, uh, this, this jut of land um, is called a crag, and this, is, this area is called Hawksbill Crag. It's a fairly famous uh, place in the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas. And um, it was a three mile hike to get here. My dog at this point was five, so he was still able to kind of go on longer walks with me. And this is a fun trip. Um, and I had someone else take the photo. But again, this will be an establishment shot because you're seeing the entire setting. You see the entire geological um, juxtaposition of the rock forming out from the side of the cliff. We're just tiny little pieces in this photo. Um, so you're in, so this would be the definition of an establishment shot. So depth of field is where objects in the photo show to be in focus, right? So the more shallow your depth of field, the more you would isolate your main subject and its focus. So think of a portrait, for example. Um, and, and these two photos, I hope you can tell the difference in depth of field with these two photos. Notice in the first one, the computer is entirely in focus. The subject behind it uh, is blurred out. So that, sh that gives you your depth of field by showing you what is closer than the other. Um, and the, your primary uh, uh, object that's, that's, that's focused here is the laptop computer. Um, with this second shot, you're seeing depth of field again. You're seeing a, a fairly natural framing. Um, the primary subject would be this tower right here, and there's even a building behind that, and there's different levels of focus that indicates the depth of field in that photo. And one very important rule with photography, and follow this for the rest of your life, especially if you love um, being a photographer and, and love the, the art uh, and just the quality that photography provides, um, don't zoom. Use the zoom feature as little as possible. I know sometimes you have to, but um, either uh, get closer to your object, meaning if you want to take a picture of something and it's too far away, instead of zooming, just move your camera closer. Just get closer. <laughs> and, uh, or um, or change the, the lens opening as well. You can do that if you're using a more high-end DSLR camera, for example, and you want, you're capable of change, changing the lens, do so please. Um, the zoom feature should be a last resort. Here's another example of depth of field. This is when I was living in Encinitas, California. Uh, had a fun four years there. Um, went to graduate school at San Diego State University. Took my surfing from good to great. And it was just, it was just, it's a beautiful setting. But San Diego is a very hard to find employment. Anyways, I'm totally going off on a tangent here. I digress. I used to always get these really yummy um, breakfast sandwiches. These are called Monte Cristos. And I'd sit on this cliffside overlooking the ocean with my dog. And I just eat these things before, you know, planning on my day. And this first photo, notice how the sandwich is in focus and the background is blurred out. So you can determine your depth of field from that. And then in the second photo, notice how now I have focused on the ocean in the background and those little lines that look like corduroy pants indicating waves coming in. Um, the really good wave here. This is an area called Swami's more specifically. Swami's is actually in the far right. Uh, this was one of my favorite surfing spots. This is called Pipes. I digress again. The sandwich now is blurred, and the train tracks and going deeper, the ocean is in focus. But again, this still reveals depth of field. So you don't have to focus necessarily on just one part of the depth. It can be entirely depending on what you want to focus on. Um, and that also creates your depth of field in the process. Now, composition is another very important aspect of photography. Um, and this chart right here indicates the rule of thirds. That is what you should always follow um, when it comes to composition. And really, it's all about where you place your subjects in the photo. And that's why the rule of thirds is followed, because you don't want to place your subject in the center of your photo. You don't want to place your subject too far to either side of the photo or top or bottom, for that matter. You want to place them in... Um, these imaginary lines, which aren't necessarily imaginary, a lot of uh, uh, mobile phone cameras now, um, you're, you can actually turn on a rule of thirds setting on there, 
but you should be able to uh, generally visualize the rule of thirds. You basically just picture in your head when you're looking uh, either at your screen or if you're looking through uh, your viewfinder, um, set up imaginary lines both vertically going top to bottom, splitting up your, your view into thirds, right? So there's one, two, three, and you also do it horizontally, one, two, three. Where the lines interject is where you want your subject in the photo to be. So, and again, you focus your camera on the subject where these lines intersect. These are your focal points. This is where the eyes naturally go when they look at a photo, which is why we follow the rule of thirds uh, in photography. And you place your subject within these focal points. And here are some examples. Um, so notice with these first two, with these two photos right here, this is actually me surfing uh, in San Diego. Um, and then the second photo is of a subject who we can uh, we can generally assume is is maybe at an art gallery or, or some sort of setting like that. Um, and hopefully you can see the rule of thirds applied in each of these photos. Um, when we apply the rule of thirds, and again, this is not an exact science, obviously, but you try to get as close as possible. So in the first photo, my friend took a picture of me surfing. He followed the rule of thirds, got me close to where those um, the where those uh, focal points are. And with the individual reading the newspaper, again, his head is placed at the rule of thirds as well in a, in a vertical uh, dimension. Um, and, and use this rule for photography. Again, this is naturally where the eyes go. And it does result in um, an effective composition for your uh, for your photo. Now, exposure refers to lighting and how much light you allow into the photo and its impact on the subject. So you don't want too much lighting, but you don't want too little either, right? If you and if you uh, if your surrounding is more lighted than your main subject, your camera will make up for it, and then you have an underexposed picture, right? Um, but if your surrounding is less lighted than your main subject, your camera will make up for it and you'll have an overexposed picture. And I'm going to show you some examples of this in just a second. And, but some ways to avoid this include um, placing your subject in shadows if it is a sunny day and you're outdoors. And you place yourself in the shadows as well, thereby uh, hopefully avoiding the interference of sunlight. Um, and you always want to focus your camera where lighting is most ideal. Some of the worst lighting possible is any form of indoor lighting at, a, at like a workplace, for example, where they use those um, fluorescent type lights, you really want to avoid that. That is just purely awful for photography. Um, so use natural light whenever possible. Um, you never want to put your subject in front of the sun or directly behind the sun. Um, you, you, you really want to strive for 45 degree angles if possible. Um, if your subject is in front of the sun, they're going to be underexposed because the, the sunlight is going to dominate the surrounding of your subject. Um, and if they're directly behind the sun, um, then there might be overexposed because of how much light is shining directly on them. Um, the best type of uh, weather for photography is a cloudy or partially sunny day, partly sunny day, I'm sorry, um, and avoid using flash at all costs. Um, use natural light. If you're a student watching this video um, as part of an assignment, avoid indoor settings whenever possible. A avoid using flash whenever possible. Um, if you have to do it inside, uh, move your subject near a window so that you're getting natural light in the process. But again, if you can do it outside, please do so. Um, it results in much better photography. Um, and here are some examples of how exposure and natural light are working in these two photos. Notice in the first one, um, again, the sun is setting so in this picture, so it's not quite as strong, but you're also not, he's, the, the photographer is also not um, having the subject placed directly uh, in the line of sunlight, but rather at a slight angle. And you can determine that based on the shadows, and this results in a properly exposed uh, subject. And the same for this picture on the right. Notice how the tree branch is underexposed, but that's okay because the tree branch is not the subject, the building is. Um, and so because of that, the, 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 the focus remains on the building. It's a cloudy day, so sunlight is not disturbing uh, the exposure of the building, and therefore you have a clean picture in the process. Here's another example. This is the campus of San Diego State University, my alma mater. Um, and this is an example of an underexposed photo, partly because I focus too much on the sky in terms of where I focus my image. So when I refocus it on some of the darker areas, I now get proper exposure um, because I, I change my focus again from 
the sky to the subject itself, in this case being the building and all the, all the natural settings in the process. Um, and it's worth noting if you take pictures with smartphones, which a lot of smartphones nowadays um, absolutely suffice when it comes to high quality pictures, where you touch your finger on the screen helps determine the exposure. So with this photo, I touched my finger uh, in the sky and where you place your finger on the screen will, will help tell your camera where you want to focus on primarily. And so because in the first photo I wanted to focus on the sky, uh, it darkened a lot of these other areas. In the second photo, I focused my, my lens on the building in this lower part that was slightly darker and so my camera provided more exposure for that area and the lighting was and the exposure was drastically improved in the process. Um, some more suggestions. Use the automatic settings on your camera when possible. The more you tinker with it, the more likely you are to mess it up. <laughs> this is true. Um, focus on one thing specifically um, and make that the subject of your photo. Uh, avoid zooming. You know, I've talked about that already, but I'll, I will happily you know, follow up on that. So get close to your subject, avoid the zoom at all costs. It'll result in a much better for, uh, photograph. Um, when you take a shot of your subject, change positions, get different angles. Um, sometimes the best shots come from a lot of experimentation. Um, and that includes getting unusual shots. Maybe you want to actually look down on a subject by holding your camera up, or maybe you want to look up at a subject and hold your camera down. Um, it's okay to mess around and take a lot of photos because the more photos you take, the higher your odds are that one of them is that gem that you truly fall in love with. So, and have fun. Photography, that's a huge part of it. It's just to have fun and, um, yeah, and just enjoy it. Um, here's some additional tips. Again, be in well-lit areas, especially outdoors. Um, partially cloudy days, uh, uh, fully cloudy overcast days are the best in terms of lighting. Um, again, don't be, don't zoom in, try to move your camera closer to the subject when, when possible. Uh, remember that the eyes do follow the rule of third. So place your subject where those intersections occur, um, and have a steady shot. I know a lot of cameras these days, uh, make up for shaking, but if you can use something as a natural tripod, whether it's you leaning on like a wall, for example, or setting your camera down on maybe like a fence um, to, to create more stability, um, a steady shot uh, results in a more high quality photo and creating a natural tripod on the process can help you with that. Um, and of course, make sure your battery's fully charged. I think that goes without saying. Um, so now some, some, some more tips for you uh, when it comes to the establishment shot. We talked about that a moment ago. It's a scene setter. Um, you're capturing a lot of environment in one photo. Um, so, and sometimes the establishment shot is referred to as the long shot. They might call it the wide shot. They might call it the full shot. Again, it shows the entire subject. And it's usually intended to put the object or person in some relation to its surroundings, right? Um, it oftentimes establishes a setting for a scene. That's why it's called the establishment shot. And it shows the relationship between important figures and objects. Um, now, part, now, lead in lines are an important variable when it comes to your establishment shot. A lead in line is any line in an image that leads your gaze into and through the, photo the photograph. You're really adding, uh, when you talk about depth of field, you're really adding depth of field and a multi-dimensional angle to your photo by having lead in lines. Um, this photo is one example. I believe this is a uh, Highway 1 here in California. And notice you, your eyes will naturally follow, in this case, the road. Um, the photographer tries to follow the rule of thirds as much as possible um, as part of the lead in line. But again, this adds so much depth to your photo. And it's not just the road that's a leading line. It's also the, the border of the cliff and the, and the ocean as well. You could call that a leading line too. Um, and, and it lets you gaze into it and through the, the photograph. Um, and again, any line of the image that leads your gaze is considered a lead in line and adds depth, literally and figuratively, uh, to your photograph. This is a picture in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, on the Gulf of Mexico, and that's my, my precious pup again, who I really miss dearly. Um, we're on a pier, 
uh, and, and just walking around. I, I don't really know how else to describe the setting. Um, but notice the leading lines of the handrail leading out to the ocean. And also when you have um, a, a horizontal line in your photo that represents, let's say, like a horizon or, a, or something that kind of indicates like a mountain some border uh, that represents the end of your photo. You try, you want to try and follow the rule of thirds with that as well. So I try to follow the rule of thirds with my dog um, while having lead in lines in the process, but also notice the horizon. I try to follow the rule of thirds with that as well. It's pretty close to the middle here, not a great example, but that's what you typically want to do. Um, foreground interest is something to consider with your establishment shots. It helps create layers of depth in your image. Um, for example, uh, in this case, this is a photo of a boat on a beach, which is in the foreground. I'm following the rule of thirds again with this photo, but it creates tremendous depth because I, the, anyone who's seeing this photo knows the boat is close, and the further out you go, um, in, at that point, uh, you, you find tremendous depth in the process. Um, and again, the rule of thirds was not fully applied to the horizon line, but it's close, and that is something you want to strive for. Um, natural framing is fantastic as well. Um, if it's applied correctly, this technique can really add a sense of majestic beauty to what would ordinarily and otherwise be a standard landscape. Um, this photo right here, for example, I believe this is in Switzerland. Um, the leaves are used as a natural frame for this, this, this island castle, um, which you do find quite a bit of in Europe. Um, here's another example. This photo was taken. Uh, also, this is part of our walk to Hawksbill Crag. Uh, my dog, Indy, and I, as part of that uh, three-mile hike, um, I took this photo. Uh, there was just a, a tree with a hole in it, and he was inside of it, and I just decided, I was like, that is a natural frame right there, and I took a photo right away. Um, and, and then, of course, the rule of thirds, just kind of adding on to that. Um, you can actually add the, the, the rule of third grids to your phone. I mentioned that just a moment ago. So if you have an iPhone, um, you just go to settings, uh, go to photo and camera, and then you press turn on grid. Now, granted, this was uh, before the recent update, but I believe this is still the step-by-step -step process. And then if you have a Droid device, um, you simply press the settings button when you're on your camera screen, which I believe is a gear, if I'm not mistaken. That's the last time I checked. Um, I am an iPhone person myself, yet I also use PC computers, which is weird, I'm sure. Um, but so for my iPhone, I don't turn this on often, but if you're a student watching this and you consider yourself uh, somewhat of a novice when it comes to photography, um, can't hurt just to at least try this out and experiment so you have a better idea as to where the rule of thirds is. And in the case of this picture with the bird, that is applied perfectly. Um, and positioning is important. So. When an object is alone in an image, the strongest position is the left-hand line. Um, an exception to this is cultures where information is read from right to left, right? And this would be like languages like Farsi or I think Arabic as well. They go right to left. But the English language and most of the languages are written and read from left to right, which is actually backwards on your screen. So I think it's actually this way. Um, and so our brains are programmed to follow that direction typically when we look at a screen, when we look at any form of canvas. Um, so you wanna place your subject on the opposite line of the direction that they're looking. Um, and I'll show you examples of this in just a second. So when a subject is not alone, there is a hierarchy of image strength. So the subject in the foreground will naturally have more strength than the subject in the background. But the rule of thirds placement can emphasize or reduce the strength um, the bottom right point is the strongest if you have multiple subjects, and the upper left point um, is considered the weakest. Uh, this is based on a lot of research, believe it or not. And again, I'll show you examples in just a second right here. In terms of a portrait shot, for example, when you want to apply the rule of thirds, um, the subject's eyes are often placed along the top rule of third line. Um, and if you have a portrait with multiple people, the faces are placed on both the top and bottom rule of third lines. This is why posing groups in multiple rows is generally more pleasing than if they're all in a single row. Think of team photos or class photos, for example. Uh, there's Jim Halpert right there from the office using him as an example. When it's one subject, notice the lines, uh, the, 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 the eyes are lined up typically with where a rule of thirds line goes. Uh, notice um, his face is positioned where the rule of thirds uh, meets at the top right of the picture. And because he's looking slightly to the left, 
I place him in the opposite side of the photo of where he's looking. Um, and it eliminates any awkwardness in the photo. Um, and the horizon, as I talked about a moment ago in landscape photos, um, these are the literal example of an establishment shot. Um, so if you're shooting a landscape photo, the rule of thirds is one of the first things you should think about when composing your photo. Um, and where you position it just depends on what you want to emphasize. Exposure comes into play. Um, so I took this photo. Uh, this was Highway 1 uh, south of Big Sur. Um, and notice the horizon is, I, I, I used the top third for the horizon because I wanted to emphasize just that incredible watercolor. I use a leading line with the road to add um, depth of field. But really, the, 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 the sky was not offering much. So my subject was more the ocean, the beach, uh, and all the natural landscape that, that is in the photo. And so I, I set my rule of thirds line um, in the top third because I wanted more detail to be in the bottom two thirds. Now, this photo was taken in the lost coast of far northern California, Humboldt County, and it was an incredible blazing sunset. And I really wanted to capture not just the ocean, but in this case, I wanted to capture the impact of the sunset on the clouds. So in this case, I set my horizon line in the bottom third, and that way two thirds of the photo covers the, the incredible lighting on the clouds, and then the one third still captures the ocean. So it just depends really on what you emphasize in your scene. Um, and you wanna align vertical subjects. So if you have a tall subject, for example, um, in the middle of the frame, this can have the same impact as a central, a centrally placed horizon. It cuts the image in half. It looks as if you haven't take, taken much care with composing your image. Um, so, for example, this was in Baja, California, the middle of nowhere. I drove to the southern tip of the peninsula and back. Um, each direction took a minimum of three days. Uh, this, the, the drive back took two weeks because of flooding and all roads being shut down. And I spent a month down there just exploring. But this was this. They, these huge cacti were in the desert there. And so I took a, a vertical photograph of this, but notice I didn't put the put it in the middle. I aimed it slightly to the left, again, following the, the imaginary rule of thirds lines. Um, here's another example. This is in Lake Tahoe. Uh, I took a picture of both the snowman, which is vertical, and then my dog, of course, in the background. He used to go everywhere with me. And uh, anyway, so... Um, yeah, so, but the snowman was not directly in the middle. And again, by putting the snowman in the left third, I also put my, my dog in the right third. Ideally, my dog would, 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 this would have been a more effective photo if Indy was standing here. Um, but, you know, you do what you can with what's in your, in your photo. And this photo was taken uh, in Southern California. This is at Encinitas. Incredibly beautiful sunset. I wanted to capture the colors of the clouds in it. So I set my rule of thirds line in the bottom third. So those are some examples of vertical subjects. Um, and you want to leave active space for moving subjects, right? So if you're taking an action photo, for example, um, you, want, you, you definitely want to follow the rule of thirds, um, especially to leave space in front of your subject. Lets you lets your eyes follow where the subject would have gone and probably did go. Um, so here's a, here's a bad example. So this is Kelly Slater in 2011, the last time he won a world title. Uh, this is in San Francisco. And I and notice in this photo the rule of thirds is applied, not here where he's looking ahead, but in the far left. And this is a very bad photo because your eyes are kind of cut off from where they want to go. And in this photo, this is Kelly Slater again. He's tucked inside of a barrel right there, but I you see where he plans on going and the direction that he is moving. It's open, so and this obviously is much more appeasing for the eyes when looking at the photo than this one, where we cut off where he was planning on going. Um, and then uh, here's a brief introduction of portrait photography. There are three basic styles of portraiture photography: um, the close-up, where you're getting a really fine detail. Um, there, then there's a torso and full body uh, portraiture, and then there's an environmental portraiture. So this is an example of a close-up. Again, you're seeing details of beard hair. You're, you see fine details of the hairline, eyebrows, uh, you know, the suit. You can almost see like the material of the suit itself. You see the hair on his hand. Um, so we've covered close-ups quite a bit already in this video, but this just kind of adds to that when it comes to a portraiture. Now, if you want a torso and full body, now you follow the rule of thirds, right? 
Um, so your subject, again, is, is placed on the left third uh, from top to bottom. We're using the imaginary rule of third lines. Um, and this photo is fantastic, in my opinion. It has some great leading lines, fantastic exposure. Um, really just a great example overall. Um, and then for environmental, that's where you can fit multiple subjects. Um, and the rule of thirds, again, with again, we have three people here. So with the imaginary rule of thirds line, you want the eyes to all line up in one of the thirds. And it comes close enough. Two of the three individuals um, line up pretty nicely and then the third one's kind of tucked down but this is not an exact exact science folks um so yeah so that's your example of a portraiture shot in a more environmental setting and then i have one more powerpoint to share with you um and this has to do more with photojournalism and where and where you're telling a story um with photographs so um let me open up that powerpoint real quickly and one of the beautiful things of watching a video on YouTube or just online is you can pause it at any point and come back later. So if you're getting tired, folks, please do take a break. All right. So photojournalism. Um, so this photo I use as my my main title holder because uh, the one award I won as a journalist, it was for online news reporting. Uh, by the Society of Professional Journalists. Um, it was a story that I covered, I believe in 2014, um, involving um, a humanitarian crisis in Tijuana, Mexico, which is right on the border with the United States, where uh, in 2014, uh, uh, we were, there were record-setting numbers of deportations occurring. Um, and I had heard through sources that a lot of the individuals being deported were being sent to Tijuana, and basically just abandoned and left to fend for themselves. And there suddenly became a massive homelessness crisis in Tijuana because of all these individuals being deported. And from my research, I started to discover um, there's over 4,000 individuals living just in the Tijuana Canal, which is pictured right here. And this photo was an example of a subject who was literally washing their clothes in one of the filthiest bodies of water. This is known as the Tijuana River. This is not a real river. This is a man-made river. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I try to, to, to the best of my abilities, um, use obviously exposure to depth of field, rule of thirds. I mean, everything I'm trying to teach you, I try to follow with this photo. And this is my main photo for my story, which again, won me my award, which I'm incredibly proud of to this day. Um, so a picture is worth a thousand words. That's the adage when, when applied to photojournalism, right? And that's a motto of a photojournalist. Um, the object, the objective, I'm sorry, of photojournalism is to produce direct, truthful, and bold images that tell the stories for those who have no voice, right? And that's really one of the core tenets of journalism in general, is to be a voice for the voiceless, right? Um, but Images obviously helps substantiate that. It helps add credibility because unlike words, a picture is generally an honest telling, uh, capturing a moment. And a photojournalist is basically a visual, a visual reporter, I'm sorry. Um, and, and so part of being a visual reporter is telling a story with your photo, but you can't just have the photo by itself tell the story. There's just simply not enough context there. And that's where captions come into play. Um, captions are vitally important for great photojournalism. So you always want to check your facts. Accuracy is vitally important and maintains the credibility of the photojournalist. So you want to find the obscure in your photos and, and attribute in your caption, right? So simply describing visuals is useless. You want to add your personal touch to the caption. You want to include what isn't so obvious in the photo. Um, you want to include a location to, to provide context for the setting of your photo. Um, you want to provide a date. So you want people to know what time of day or year this is. Um, or maybe it's a specific event that is taking place in your photograph and you might want to tell the readers or the viewers um, what that is. Try to avoid starting, starting sentences in a photo caption with the word slash letter A, the word N, the word the, or the name of your subject. These are just some tips for effective captions uh, in, in a photojournalism piece. Um, when, you're, when you're publishing a photo that you would consider to be a photojournalism piece where you're telling a story, 
Identify the main people in the photo. If you know names, include them. Um, if you don't know the names, or if you don't want to include them for privacy reasons, include a, a general description of who they are. The reader should understand who, the, who these subjects are in your photo and why they're there in the first place. Um, so answer the curious viewer's and a, a question of why in your caption. Um, and if there's a large group of people in your photo, let's say you're taking a photo of a, a city street block where there's a lot of people walking around, uh, just avoid naming them at that point. Um, if there's more than one person in your photo, you want to identify from left and not from left to right uh, when you're writing your caption. So you would write from left and then you start naming your subjects. Um, and this is because there's an adage in journalism called cut the flap. So for students taking one of my reporting classes, for example, I tell them routinely, cut the flab because they're using unnecessary verbiage. Um, the less words you use, the more effective your communication is. Um, and a great journalist only uses words that are necessary. So when you're writing a caption for a photojournalism piece, for example, adding the, the two words to write is it's unnecessary. It's borderline redundant um, simply because the moment you say from left, the reader can absolutely determine what direction the names are going. There's no need to add to right. So simply just write from left and leave it there. Less words, the better. It's more effective communication and leaves you more space for your caption as well. Um, specificity is vitally important. Um, if you don't know the names or locations in your photo, find out. Um, it just helps tell the story that you're trying to convey to your viewer. Uh, maintain present tense. Um, you're telling a story and in your reader's mind, the story's happening as they're observing the photo and reading the caption. So don't tell the story like it happened previously. Tell the story like it's happening right then and there. Um, avoid humor if it's a serious subject matter for your photo. Um, if the subject is not serious, levity is welcome. Be humorous, totally okay. But again, it depends again on the subject matter. Uh, you wanna inform the reader. You wanna be someone who is informative and in providing them with information. Um, so the caption that you write should teach the reader something new. Um, try to avoid judgmental commentary, just stick to the facts, convey the subject's emotions only if they conveyed it to you. So in other words, if you take a photo of a, of a subject and they tell you how they're feeling, include that. Um, if they don't tell you, don't assume and just leave that judgmental uh, and subjective commentary out of the caption. Um, if you've altered your photo, if you use Photoshop, for example, to make changes to it, explain what those edits are and why you made them. Um, so for example, if you're taking my new media class and you're doing a photojournalism assignment uh, and you're detailing a, a, an image that you've edited using Photoshop, explain in the caption what those edits are and why you made them. And again, the focus here is on quality. Um, the length of your caption is totally irrelevant if your photo, um, oh, I'm sorry, if it captivates the reader and accentuates the photo. So what I mean by that is only write what is necessary. Don't go overboard trying to be creative in your verbiage. Um, as long as your caption and photo captivates the reader, and if your caption accentuates the photo, you're fine. And I always encourage simplicity and just sticking to the basics while paying attention to detail um, with any writing that you publish. So that is it. That is my lecture on uh, photojournalism and the fundamentals of photography. Hope that was informative. Hope that was helpful. And thank you. Later.